getting your cat or dog to the veterinarian on a good day can be quite difficult, overwhelming, incredibly emotional, especially for those of us in the healthy pet space or those of us who maybe know a little bit more than the average pet parent and question a little bit of what goes on uh, in traditional veterinary medicine can be really, really difficult on a good day. But what happens when something goes wrong? What happens when your pet needs surgery or is severely injured? These times can be can, can turn your world upside down. And I recently had just such an experience with my cat, Romeo. So today, on today's episode, we are going to talk about what happened. What happened to my cat, Romeo, and the five lessons that I learned that I'm going to share with you that can help you get through the next, oh my gosh, what am I going to do when it comes to working with your veterinarian to help your pet. So let's get right into it. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Okay, so yes, I took my cat Romeo in to the veterinarian to have his teeth cleaned. Now, there is a good deal of backstory to this. And so let's start there. Let's start with the backstory, get you caught up to day of surgery, okay? I have had my cat Romeo, he is roughly 15 years old. Uh, that's what I'm estimating. He was uh, in a feral colony that I took care of many, 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 many years ago, um, which is why he has an ear tip. So if you've seen a picture of him on social media, his uh, ear is tipped. And that is because he used to live in a feral colony. Now, when I met my now husband and moved in with him, I, I was moving between cities and I packed up my feral cat colony and moved them as well. Romeo was part of that colony. So he lived outside for a number of years. When I had him neutered, when I did TNR way back in the day and I had trapped him, he was estimated to be about two years old. So my best estimate is that he is around 15 years old. And I'll talk to you in just a minute about why that is such a big estimate. But before we do, let me just kind of get through the rest of this story. So when we decided to move to California a couple of years after I met my now husband, I, the, the feral colony that I had had kind of slowly dwindled down to just two cats. And so I packed them up with my, all of my indoor cats. And I said, you two are going to be indoor cats now. And it worked out pretty well. Thank goodness. And today I have four cats left. Romeo is my only cat remaining from my feral colony. He, and sometimes he still acts <laughs> like an outdoor cat, let me tell you, but uh, I digress and that is not part of the story. He, for many years now, has had what veterinarians call resorptive disease. And this is something that affects their teeth. So basically the immune system actually attacks the enamel of the teeth, breaking down the enamel on the teeth, which then exposes nerves and it's, it can be very painful and it requires a lot of extra upkeep in the way of dental health for our, for animals that have it. And for a, a number of years, he was actually getting his teeth cleaned every six months. 
And he has had extractions in the past because of the resorptive disease and the immune system attacking certain teeth, um, the enamel of those teeth, and it just it wasn't a good situation. They had they had to be removed. So for the past two two maybe maybe even three years, he has had his teeth cleaned once a year because at those cleanings, my veterinarian has said his teeth are looking great. There's no extractions um, nothing, nothing big going on. Great. Um, so we have gone from having to have his teeth cleaned every six months to every year, which was, which was wonderful. But this past year now, side note, he has always had stinky breath. Like that's just him. He has always had stinky breath this past, I don't know, four or five months. He has had really, really really bad breath. So I kind of knew I had in the back of my mind, oh goodness, we were, we're coming up on, you know, we're not at a year yet, but, but that's okay because, you know, we probably need to get his teeth cleaned. Well, we got his annual blood work done as you would have to do to get their teeth cleaned anyway, to, to put an animal under anesthesia, you have to do the routine blood work, lab work, and make sure they're healthy enough to undergo anesthesia. And we found that he had a hyperthyroid uh, issues. So before we could get his teeth cleaned and put him under anesthesia, we had to get his uh, thyroid condition under control, which we have done with the use of uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, and I have consulted multiple veterinarians about this. And, and so for this particular condition, Pharmaceuticals are recommended. It is specifically a drug called methimazole. And so we started him on the methimazole. We had to wait for it to work to get his thyroid levels back to a normal zone. And once that happened, we of course had to test his blood again to get the thyroid levels. Once we knew that he was all good to go, we have the hyperthyroid condition under control. Now we can go ahead and put him under anesthesia. So yes, did it take a little bit longer than I would have liked to get his teeth cleaned this time around? Absolutely. Uh, but because of his thyroid, there wasn't a whole lot I could do about it. So the day comes, I've got you caught up. The day comes <laughs> when we are going to, uh, you know, I take him in to the veterinarian in the morning. Now, before we get too much further into this, let me give you the breakdown of the veterinarians who are on my care team at this point. At this point, I have my primary care veterinarian who is an integrative veterinarian who does house calls. So she is not doing the um, anesthetic dental procedure, the, ana the dental proce procedure with the anesthesia. Um, that's not something she does. She is a house call vet. She does the lab works and the checkups and she'll do acupuncture if needed, blah, 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 all the things, chiropractic. Um, so I had to, of course, find, uh, add another veterinarian to Romeo's care team. Um, the veterinarian who we had been going to at this particular office recently, in the past couple of months, decided that he doesn't work there anymore. I don't know what happened. I, I don't know him personally. He just doesn't work there anymore. So we were transferred to a new veterinarian. Fortunately, I really like her. She's excellent. She's great. She's not um, as holistically minded as my primary care veterinarian, but that's okay. Um, we work with what we have. Very, very nice, sweet lady. And she did the procedure for Romeo. Now we knew going in, that his teeth were bad and he was going to have extractions. I had no idea the day I, I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And I'm like, I, I got him there at eight 30 this morning. It's, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon. I haven't heard that he's been out of the procedure. What is going on? Like I was expecting him to be like first in first out because, you know, when you have, big giant tasks in front of you you tend to like the best way to get through the day is to do the things you don't want to do first to do the big 
big things first and then all the other stuff will kind of work its way up. Well, apparently that is not what this particular veterinarian chose to do. She saved Romeo for last because she knew it was going to be such a difficult procedure. So, um, I, I, she calls me in the afternoon and had to be four 30 in the afternoon and they close at six. So I was of course going to need to pick him up by six o'clock. He had 17, one, seven, 17 teeth extracted. Holy moly. That is a lot. And I'm just like in awe, does he have any, I like, because he's had extractions in the past. How does he even have this many teeth that need to be pulled? Well, he now only has six teeth left. <laughs> and she said that if they didn't look so beautiful, that she probably would have pulled them too, but they look, they looked incredible. So she didn't pull them. Um, and understand resorptive disease can be incredibly painful for the person or animal that has it. So these teeth really needed to come out. Um, mind you, he wasn't really giving me a whole lot of indication that, um, he was in pain, anything more than, than his normal behavior. Um, he was eating okay. He wasn't, of course he, you know, he doesn't eat hard food. Um, so maybe that was part of it, but it, at any rate, he had to have 17 teeth pulled. That's a lot. That is, uh, I, I, like, I just couldn't imagine. He came home. I picked him up. He came home with a mouth full of stitches. And this is where things get bumpy. But before we get into that and the lessons learned, uh, let's take a quick break for our sponsor and I'll be right back. Today's episode is brought to you by the Furry Family Coach Dog Training. Train your dog in the comfort of your own home and on your schedule with video instruction from me. Learn the foundations of training, teach basic cues to your dog, and explore solutions to behavioral issues all inside of this video-based online training course. Go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to see you on the inside. Welcome back. So talking about my cat Romeo and these 17 teeth he had extracted. It's been about, oh, well, tomorrow will be two weeks. Well, from the day I'm recording this, by the time you're hearing this, it will be a little over two weeks since he had this procedure done. And when I brought him home, it was for me, one of the most stressful and emotional things I've done in a very long time. He, uh, of course, and I knew this, was going to have a lot of pain going on. So they, at, at, during the procedure or at the end of the procedure, as precaution, they, of course, will give him anti-inflammatories. He got an antibiotic and pain medication. That's all normal stuff that they will do with extractions in um, any sort of dental procedure that, that they do on an animal. And he came home. I went to pick him up. And by the time I got there, which was like right at six o'clock, I, um, I was rushing to get there before they closed. And the veterinarian, I, I don't know if she had already left for the day, but I couldn't, they wouldn't, they said I she wasn't available for me to talk to her. Um, they were rushing to close the doors. They were just trying to get him to me and me out of there and gave me medication, one of which was gabapentin. Now, if you've been listening to the show for any period of time, you may remember back to the episode with Dr. Josie Bugue. Uh, it was actually the first episode of 2023. And she was talking about gabapentin specifically, and then, of course, some other pharmaceutical medications that we never want to give our pets. And because of that episode, because of talking to Dr. Bube, because of doing my own research and looking at different studies and different 
uh, blog posts that other veterinarians have put out into the world, I know that gabapentin is not good for pain. They prescribe it for pain. It does not work for pain. It is a sedative. So they give it to cats a lot because it is a sedative and it will make your cat really, really tired and really, really sleepy. Um, meanwhile, the pain is still there, but you don't know it because your cat is really, really tired and really, really sleepy. Now, our situation was a little different because he had all of these stitches in his mouth, which made everything feel weird. And he did not want to eat. He wanted to eat really badly, but every time he would take a bite, he would take a, like a little lick of something that I gave him. And believe me, I tried everything I could think of to give him to eat. It felt so weird and I could see it on his face and the way he was using his paws um, at his mouth. It felt so weird that he did not want to eat. He wanted to eat, he was hungry, but he didn't want to eat because of how it felt. And now cats are very um, textural when it comes to their food. So everything has to be the right texture for them to eat. And these stitches were not doing it for him. So we went through the weekend and my primary veterinarian, thank goodness for her, she was incredible. The only thing that the gabapentin was obviously not working and I knew it wasn't going to work, but it was all I had. And as a pet parent, I'm like, this is what I got. This is what I've got. So I was giving him full spectrum CBD from CBD dog health. And I was putting that on his paw pads to absorb in because let me tell you, he was not under any circumstances letting me get anywhere near his mouth. So I was letting the full spectrum CBD um, seep in through his paw pads. And once, once I crushed up a gabapentin pill and put it in his, in some tuna juice, which he did drink. Um, from that point on, <laughs> the only thing that was helping him was a pharmaceutical called Onsior. Now this is an anti-inflammatory. And because it's an anti-inflammatory, they also use it, um, consider it to be pain management because inflammation will cause pain. And if we can decrease the inflammation, then we are in effect also relieving some of the pain. So he was also getting crushed up pills of Onsior in tuna juice. Now this was layered with a full spectrum CBD but it wasn't enough. What would happen is if I could get him to drink the tuna juice with the Onsior crushed in it, which only happened once over the weekend, then he would feel pretty good for about, it would take about 45 minutes to an hour to work. I would get about two to three hours out of him where he felt good enough to eat something that was like a puree, like mush. So I would feed him two to three times in, the, in that two to three hour period, get as much food into him as he would eat in that two to three hour period. And then the rest of the time he felt like crap. So my first lesson, getting ready to get to, <laughs> is that not all vets are created equal. So Monday morning, promptly Monday morning, I call the veterinarian's office. My primary care vet over the weekend was nice enough to go into the clinic and get me another pill of Onsior because I didn't have enough because he wasn't eating it when I crushed it into his food. So I was wasting tablets. Uh, so she was nice enough to go in and get me another pill of Onsior. And I met her and at the clinic and she went in and got me another pill. So by me saying that she was a rock star, she was incredible. She was absolutely incredible. I appreciate her so much for doing that. Promptly Monday morning, I called the clinic and the veterinarian who did the procedure on Friday had called out sick on Monday. They only had one other veterinarian at the clinic. He was overworked, of course, now trying to do all of the appointments for two veterinarians. And of course, always having emergency. They always have emergencies. He got me in. They got me in in the afternoon. It was like a 4.30 appointment. 
and Romeo was in pain. He wasn't eating. And I talked to, and her fourth veterinarian, my mentor and teacher, Dr. Ruth Roberts, on Monday morning, told her what was going on, really was just venting. She told me, you know, keep up with the CBD, maybe add some THC, and ask for buprenorphine at the veterinarian's office. So I go to the veterinarian at 4.30 between, sorry, let me go back, between talking to Dr. Ruth and the veterinarian's appointment at 4.30, what I learned was that I cannot get THC that is uh, acceptable for pets use in the state of Texas because there is something called Delta 9 THC and Delta 8 THC. Delta 9 THC is what is found in full spectrum uh, hemp CBD and is approved, is, is known by using the studies known to work well in animals. Delta 9 is not available in Texas. Delta 8 is available in Texas. However, it does not seem to work well with animals in studies, which by the way are very limited, but it is what it is. So could not go down the extra THC route, although I wish I could have. I can't where I am. I'm in Texas. 4.30 comes around. I get We get to our appointment. I was not allowed to see the veterinarian. He was, he was too busy. And you know what? The rational part of my brain understands that um, because he was trying to do probably the work of four veterinarians <laughs> because all veterinarians are overworked to begin with. And then he had the other veterinarian call out sick. Uh, but I was not allowed to talk to the veterinarian. He would not listen. The uh, people at the front desk said that he he's not going to do whatever I want wanted to do. Um, he took they took Romeo back, gave him an injection of Onsior. Um, he did not check Romeo. He did not look in his mouth. I asked. I said, did they check to make sure everything's looking okay in the mouth before giving him another? Nope. Not nope. Not doing it. Not doing it. Now, <laughs> not all veterinarians are created equal because I'm trying really hard to think rationally, think through this rationally. I understand how overwhelmed he is. The reality of the situation is that's malpractice, that he absolutely should have checked out his patient before administering any medication. What if Romeo had had an abscess in his mouth? What if something had gone wrong and pain medicine is not going to help the situation, that something else needed to be done? That was malpractice. Um, so when I say not all veterinarians are created equal, I'm giving you this spectrum of four different veterinarians now that I have worked with to help Romeo in this situation. And you're seeing how differently they're all reacting and responding. Now, I bring Romeo home because he got an injection of Onsior. He did eat a little bit more. Thank goodness. I, of course, I told, you know, when I left the veterinarian's office, I left a message for the vet that did the procedure, who was supposed to be back in Tuesday morning doing more procedures, for her to call me. She called me Tuesday morning, told her what happened. She said, bring him in, um, drop him off with me. I will see him in between procedures. Thank goodness. She is a beautiful, beautiful soul. She did a full checkup, looked in his mouth, checked him out, gave him more fluids, gave me more medication to bring home and gave him some in the office because the whole point here is, now that's lesson number one, right? Not all veterinarians are created equal. Lesson number two, I've already told you as well, Pain management in this instance was key, and gabapentin is not going to cut it. Gabapentin is prescribed as a pain medication in animals, but it only sedates them. It really is completely ineffective, and what I will do is in the show notes, I will link to um, the episode with Dr. Josie Bug, so you can go back and listen to that, but also to her posts where she is listing the studies showing that it is not effective for pain management in animals. And I am, I, I like this experience with Romeo 
has proven to me that it isn't because it did not work for him. Did not work for him for pain management whatsoever. I almost forgot a very important part of lesson two, pain management for your cats. And I had to come back and record this because it is so important. I had to make sure to get it into this episode. So uh, I was telling you that in Texas, I cannot get THC that is uh, good for pets to use. So What I did, I actually reached out to Angela Argolino, who owns CBD Dog Health, and I was talking to her about this. So one, we are planning to do a a series later this year to show people what to do and how to choose um, extra when you need extra THC for your pet, how how to go about finding that and what to look for, which is really, really fun. But what she told me is to use the ease formula from cbd dog health so if you go to cbd dog health uh, which i am pulling up on the screen for you right now if you're watching the video you can see this if not you that's okay i'm going to walk you through it Um, but let me just pull up the ease formula so what uh, the ease formula has in it that the regular heel formula while the heel formula is uh, a little bit stronger the ease formula that they have has turmeric and frankincense in it and these are adaptogens just like cbd is and adaptogens what that means is that they adapt to whatever the body needs so they you know, whether say the liver is having problems or there's a a pain issue, uh, or maybe there's, you know, uh, cognitive dysfunction in the brain, whatever is going on, there are heart problems, there are lung problems, there are kidney issues, whatever it is, because the master system of all of our uh, mammalian bodies is the endocannabinoid system, adaptogens fill in the holes anywhere in any of these systems that need help and support. So uh, the hemp plant itself and the extraction that we call CBD, um, the full spectrum CBD is an adaptogen. Turmeric is an adaptogen. Frankincense is an adaptogen. Um, Lavender is an adaptogen. So what Angela told me to do, and I didn't have the time to get what I needed delivered to me. Uh, Romeo was feeling better by the time I got it delivered. Other adaptogens that can be used are things like the Glacier uh, Peaks has a couple of products. One of them is called Inflapotion and the other is called Herbaprint or Herbaprint, depending on how how you um, (laughs) describe it. So Herbaprin, and I will again pull this up on the screen uh, so you can see it if you are watching the video. Herbaprin is going to help animals relax, sleep, and heal, it says. It's an ideal companion to Inflapotion, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and a perfect choice for relieving discomfort safely and effectively. If you have a dog, (laughs) you could use Herbaprin. Inflapotion, however, we can use for cats. So let's talk about Inflapotion. It's 100% organic. It addresses inflammation. It contains natural anti-inflammatory herbs. The anti-inflammatory herbs inside of Inflapotion are marshmallow root, slippery elm, echinacea, red clover, spirulina, milk thistle, and comfrey leaf. So these are additional adaptogens. Uh, Again, if you have a dog, you can also use the Herbaprint. Cats, you cannot, but Inflapotion is good for both cats and dogs. So another adaptogen to think about is mushroom tincture. So we can layer adaptogens to help with pain and inflammation in the body or really anything else, quite honestly, going on with our pets. And that is another way that we can help with pain management without 
necessarily having to rely on pharmaceuticals. Third lesson here is that cats need to eat. This was my, while I was incredibly concerned about his pain level because he was in pain, I was even more concerned, if that's possible, with getting him to eat because here's the reality. Cats will starve themselves. Dogs generally, unless of course there is something going on with the mouth and they physically can't, will not starve themselves. That's just how they're built. They're going to eventually eat something when they're hungry enough. Cats, if they, whether, you know, if they're stopped up and they can't smell their food, so they stop eating or something is going on with their mouth and they're in pain and they stop eating, or they're just so sick and don't have any energy and they stop, whatever, they don't like the food you're giving them, they are not going to eat. It, 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 it just is one of these truths of life about the feline species, our indoor cats specifically, or domesticated cats, they will starve themselves if they don't have food that they want to eat. So I, knowing that he had a mouthful of stitches and this was a big hindrance to him, I was doing everything I can. And here's, here's what happened with me. I had to give my cat a food that I would never under normal circumstances give him. I gave him Royal Canaan Recovery. Now, this is something that, again, under normal circumstances, I would not give an animal. But because he had to eat, I had to get food in him. He was down to 8.7 pounds at the time of his dental procedure. Um, and that is partly to do with his hyperthyroidism. I, we couldn't afford for him to not eat. So getting him to eat trumped my preference for what he was eating. And that's a big statement for me because I am huge on feeding the absolute best food we can to our pets. But guess what? They got to eat it. They got to eat. And that's the reality. So cats have to eat. That is the third lesson from this whole story. Number four is that resorptive disease is no joke. I, of course, Romeo is the one that actually has to live with it, but as his caretaker have been living with him with resorptive disease for, well, I've been taking care of him now for 13 ish plus years. And it's, it is no joke. It can be incredibly detrimental to the health of your pet, very painful. And, you know, every animal needs good dental care and dental hygiene. And we need to be able to do it. You know, if I, I, of course, we all wish we knew then what we knew now, any kitten I ever get from here on out, I'm going to socialize them to let me brush their teeth. And I know that now, of course, I have 15 and 16 year old cats now who are not at all keen on letting me do that. But as a, a kitten, boy, oh boy, work on that. Work on letting, the, letting them let you touch their paws and get in their mouth and put your fingers in their mouth because it is so important later on down the road. It may not seem like it when there are kittens, but later on down the road, it is so important. And resorptive disease is nasty, 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 nasty. If you have a cat with it, be vigilant. Uh, for me, I don't care if the vet says you can go a year. <laughs> We're not going a year. Again, it's not happening because this was tough on both of us. And fortunately, before I get to number five, fortunately, you know, we went about a week. He was in pain. He was in a lot of pain. And the last, I'd say, day and a half of that week, it wasn't as much the pain for him. And, and you know, I was paying really, really close attention to all of his behaviors. I would say it wasn't as much the pain for him as the stitches were starting to come undone. And when he was eating, I could see he was, he was starting to eat a lot better. But he was pawing at his mouth because of these darn stitches. And, you know, I just, I, I can't, I don't know what that feels like. I can imagine what that feels like, how uncomfortable. So he was just really, 
I think frustrated and, and uncomfortable with the stitches that were in his mouth and they were starting to come undone because they are, um, uh, dissolvable stitches. So they were just starting to loosen up and come undone because it was just time for them to do so. And now it was, it took about eight on day eight, day nine, we were really starting to get much more back to normal in the groove of things. And he was eating so much better and a lot more food. And right now where we are, we are, as of the day I'm recording this tomorrow, we'll be two weeks out from the procedure. I, I feel like we are, we're back to normal where we have gotten to where I think all of the stitches are out. He has learned to eat with hardly any teeth. He has six teeth left. Poor guy, bless his heart. But it has been an incredible journey. And I won't say that I handled it the best. I was incredibly stressed out and I was trying not to be stressed out with him. But, uh, when I would leave his side, I was, I was a bit of a mess at times. Um, so my fifth lesson in all of this is to trust your gut and your intuition and you know your pets best. Yeah. You may not have a veterinary degree, you may not have, you know, extended education in how to care for animals, but you know your pets best. You know their behaviors and their routines. And if something seems off, it's probably for a good reason. There's probably something going on. And I had to be his advocate and know that he was in pain and know that he needed to eat. I could have easily said, uh, you'll get over it you know, we just have to get through this. No big deal. And what would have happened if he didn't eat for a few days? That would have been horrendous. That could have that uh, literally for a cat who was down to 8.7 pounds, which is very small for him and not eating for a few days could have really let us down a bad, bad, bad path, um, that we may not have been able to get Dig our, dig our way out of. Um, so trust your gut. Be your pet's advocate, no matter what that means. doesn't matter if that means you are being, um, you know, a, a quote unquote pest, that you are calling the vet too much, that you are um, asking too much of it. Whatever it is, you do it because you are the best advocate, the number one advocate for your pet. That is your responsibility. That is your job to care for your pet. And I, I person, I do not, do not care what these veterinarians think of me, um, outside of the fact that one of them, I do want to continue. Well, t the, the veterinarian who performed the procedure, I do like her. She was incredibly nice and I will work with her again, but it, Romeo, my cat. Romeo was my number one priority. And that's just the way it has to be. I have to, I have to advocate for him just like you have to advocate for your pets. So these are, these are the lessons that I am bringing to you out of my experience. Number one, not all vets are equal. They're not going to be, they're people just like us. And we have to deal with that the best way we can. And if we're not getting what we need, um, in fact, the, the, the veterinarian who saw him on Monday, who did not look at him, did not look in his mouth, gave, gave him an injection of an anti-inflammatory, um, which did help him, I will say, eat that day. Um, the reality is he should have told me to go to an emergency vet. Would I have liked that answer? Probably not but I would have done it because he didn't do what he should have done. He didn't have the bandwidth to do what he should have done. And I understand that rationally, but my rational brain doesn't kick in when I know that Romeo is my number one priority. So not all vets are created equal. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, pain management is key. So we have to, have to, have to be knowledgeable about these prescriptions that they are giving us. I knew gabapentin 
was not going to work. I broke down and gave it to my cat because I had no other options over the weekend outside of going to the emergency vet who, by the way, would have probably just given me gabapentin because that's what they're, that's what they're giving now. That is what they're giving. Fortunately, I had a full spectrum CBD on hand and I was layering that. I will just really quickly let you know, uh, both CBD and gabapentin are, um, processed through the liver. So if you are going to layer anything like that, be very, very, very aware of what you're doing. I am not I'm a holistic pet health coach, but I am not your holistic pet health coach. I don't know what's going on with your pet and I'm not giving you medical advice. If you layer anything that the liver has to process, you need to give time between them. That's just one caveat that I will, will, uh, let you in on because it is important to know. And I, I, I hope by giving you these tips that it will send you down the road of doing more research on your own so you feel comfortable and confident with the things you're doing with your pet. Number three, lesson learned, cats need to eat. Our dogs need to eat too, obviously. But as I said earlier, cats will starve themselves. We have to make that a priority. Uh, If your cat is not eating for more than a day or two, that is a problem. And we have to be their advocate to do whatever we need to do to make sure they are eating. Um, number four, resorptive disease is no joke. Any disease that you're, or, or, or disease or illness that your pet may be going through, don't take it lightly. Do your research. Know what is going on. Be, again, your pet's advocate. And the best way to do that is to educate yourself on it and do whatever needs to be done to make sure they are taken care of. And number five is trust your gut because again, you are their advocate and we need to be able to trust ourselves. The best way for me to be able to trust myself is to put in the work, to learn what I need to learn, to go do the research. That makes me a more confident person, makes me a more confident pet parent. And so that's what I want to encourage you to do as well. So those are the five things I learned and oh boy, was this an ordeal, but you know what? We got through it. And I am so glad and so thankful for the veterinarians who were there for me, who are on my team, and everybody else who helped as well, including my husband, who was very helpful when I did have to give um, some injections to Romeo at home. (laughs) And he was incredibly helpful in that. So, uh, yeah, surround yourself with, with people who care, who are going to help you. Those are my tips and I hope they can help you. And I hope this experience can help you and know that if you are in a tough spot with your pet, that you can get through it, that you can learn what you need to learn, that you can be your pet's advocate and get them through it the best you can. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end today's episode. Thank you so much for hanging in there with me. I know this week was supposed to be an interview episode. If you are a, um, Longtime listener, you know, I alternate solo episodes with interview episodes, but this was something I needed to get to you. Uh, so I will make up for it. And in the next two weeks, we will do interview episodes to make up for it. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Please give your pets some extra love from me. Uh, and I hope, I hope the tips in this episode were helpful. Reach out to me on social media. I'm at, on Instagram at the Pet Parenting Reset and let me know just how much this did help you. I would very much appreciate it. With that, again, give your pet some extra love for me and I'll talk to you next week. Bye guys. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos in my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh.